Thank you for joining us tonight for After Dark Online Bees. My name is Kathleen McGuire, and I'm part of the team that puts together the Exploratorium's weekly After Dark Online series. While tonight's program has been recorded remotely, I would like to acknowledge that the home of the Exploratorium, Pier 15 in San Francisco, is located on unceded territory traditionally belonging to the Ramatouche Ohlone people. I pay my respect to elders past present, and future for their caretaking and shepherding of the land. Tonight's After Dark Online, Bees, is made possible with the generous support of Ghirardelli Square and Levi's Plaza. These properties maintain beehives on site to support a thriving ecosystem. Later on in tonight's program, we'll dive into honey bees as we watch the short film Detroit Hives and hear from the subjects of the short and founders of the nonprofit Detroit Hives, Tim Paul and Nicole Lindsay. We'll also hear from Cameron Redford about his project, Black Hives Matter, and his work as a beekeeper. We'll close the program with a short from Deep Look, a series produced by KQED that gets up close to alfalfa leafcutter bees. That piece will be introduced by Deep Look coordinating producer, Gabriela Quiros. Up first, we'll be hearing from Dr. Gretchen Laboon about pollinators in the Bay Area and the citizen science project, The Great Sunflower Project. Dr. Laboon is a professor of biology at San Francisco State University and the director of The Great Sunflower Project. At SF State, her research group focuses on the effects of human-induced climate change on wildlands in California and beyond. They have used pollinators and plants as models for understanding the key drivers of biodiversity in urban parks, vineyard landscapes, montane meadows, and other wildlands. They have a specific interest in developing cost-efficient monitoring, the role of climate change, as well as the effects of urbanization on wildlife. The other major area of the group's research is the development of citizen science projects, which ties very closely to Dr. Laboon's role as the director of the Great Sunflower Project, the largest citizen science project focused on pollinators in the world, and something you'll be hearing quite a bit about in her talk. One thing before we get to Dr. Laboon, throughout tonight's program, we'll share a few short photo shows of up close images of various bee species. These images are courtesy of the USGS Native Bee Inventory and Monitoring Program. The USGS Native Bee Inventory and Monitoring Program design and develop large and small scale surveys for native bees. And as part of their program, they produce these amazing high res images of the specimen they track, thousands of which you can find on their Flickr page.
thank you so much, Kathleen. I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is one of my favorite things to do. So today I want to talk about um, not honeybees, but actually native bees. And in particular, I want to talk about the role that they play in producing things that we really like. And then about a citizen science project that I started a number of years ago. We're actually um, beyond our 10th year and um, how you can help pollinators by participating in a project like this. But I also think it's really interesting to see how these projects are put together and how the different pieces come together to sort of give us some answers and to improve habitat and conservation. All right, so I want to begin with putting pollinators and in particular bees in a context. And I love this GIF because I want you to stop for a moment and think about breakfast. I imagine that you had a little toast, maybe some cereal, some orange juice, a little coffee, maybe you poured some cream in your coffee. And as this GIF elegantly speaks to you, without pollinators, it's a different story. So without pollinators, you don't have the fruits and berries on your cereal. You don't have the nuts in your cereal. The butter's gone because cows are largely dependent on pollinators for their alfalfa that they, they eat. Um, that also means if you're dependent on cream in that coffee, um, you need to have those pollinators uh, producing that alfalfa. Your orange juice is gone. And probably most importantly, your coffee. Boom. Coffee is actually not bee pollinated, it's fly pollinated, but it is dependent on pollinators for production. So how does this get put together? Um, I always think it's a good idea to go back and review some basic biology. Um, I had to laugh when I um, asked my very own child um, exactly what pollinators did. She very elegantly explained to me that bees, this little thing up here is a bee, pick up pollen from flowers and then they carry it over to other flowers where they sprinkle it around and fertilize the plant. Clearly she didn't have the same meaning for fertilization that I did. So let's look at this. Um, what scientists know is that the number of species of pollinator and the abundance of pollinators, meaning the number of individuals of pollinators, those two things combine and determine the number of visits that any plant gets by pollinators. And the number of visits that pollinators, um, that a plant gets, determine the number of seeds and fruits that are produced by that plant. And so what pollinate what pollinators do is they pick up pollen from the male part of one plant and carry it to a new or different, uh, to a different flower usually. And in the process of landing on that next flower, they um, hit the female part of the flower, the pollen sticks, and it grows down and it fertilizes um, what's called an ovule, which is like an unfertilized egg. And once that ovule is fertilized, it becomes it, it can become a seed within a fruit. So how much of a difference does this make? Well, it turns out that um, if you think about it, it, it makes a difference in two ways. It first makes a difference um, because the number of fruits that are produced is, and number of fruits and seeds is, is less but it also has an impact on the quality of fruit. So here are some pictures of pollinators. Let me see why I'm not going forward. There we go. Uh, of what fruits look like without pollinators. So here you see three different strawberry fruits. The first one is a beautiful one that you go to the farmer's market, you'd say, hey, yeah, that's mine. I want a bunch that look like this. For the second group, what the scientists who did this experiment did is they put netting around the strawberry plants and did not allow any pollen to come in that was brought in by wind or by an insect. And then they thought, well, you know, let's also see what happens 
uh, sorry, this is this middle one allows wind in. They also looked at what happens if you prevent wind also. And you can see that while you do actually get a fruit and there are a few seeds on the outside of these strawberry plant, strawberry fruits, they do not look like something you would pay top dollar at a farmer's market for. So there's a real incentive to have um, pollinators for plants. They, they allow plants to produce more and, uh, and better uh, fruits and seeds. So you had to have been um, stuck in a, a desert with no contact with anyone to not have heard that bees were in decline. And the first, the first thing that got people's attention was colony collapse disorder, which affected honeybees. Well, honeybees are just a single species. And um, I know it's sort of crazy. People don't really realize that there's only one honeybee that, that in the United States that does all of that pollination. It turns out that here in the United States, we actually have about 4,000 species of native bees. Here in California, we have about 1,500 species of native bees. And probably in the Bay Area, if you take the greater Bay Area, somewhere between 300 and 400 species. So think about that. We have 300 to 400 species of bees, only one of which is a honeybee. And those honeybees are actually brought into the United States. Um, uh, originally, uh, uh, originally, they came into Jamestown on boats from England because that was a way to have sugar, something sweet on the boat, um, on the, you know, sweet because the bees were producing honey. So we discovered that honeybees were declining um, because people who manage honeybees keep really good track of sort of how many of their hives are doing well and poorly. And colony collapse disorder was identified and, um, and honeybee uh, farmers went from losing about 15% of their bees over a year to 30%. So it was a significant decline. When that happened, we started looking more closely at native bees. And we realized that we knew virtually nothing. There were no long-term monitoring programs. There was no one really tracking what was happening with native bees. And one of my students, um, Quinn McFrederick, um, a former graduate student of mine, did a study here in the city of San Francisco and looked at honeybees. And wouldn't you know, he was unable to look at, locate about half the honeybees that were known to San Francisco including one of the most common bumblebees in the Western US. Completely disappeared from San Francisco and no one noticed. And I have to say, even I, a bee expert, did not notice. That's how bad the situation was. So in that context, um, I started something called the Great Sunflower Project. And the goal of the Great Sunflower Project was to identify the areas across the United States where pollinators were doing well and poorly. And I want to tell you a little bit more about it. So the Great Sunflower Program, um, the goal is to engage the public to do conservation for bees. And there are three programs. Um, there's what we call the Great Sunflower Program, where people plant sunflowers. Um, and we use this to identify what the drivers of pollination service is. And pollination service is that process by which it means bees moving pollen for plants. And then we have the Pollinator Friendly Plants Program, which um, identifies the critical plants that support pollinators in different parts of the country. So um, we ask people to go out and, and count visits to as many bees, as, as many bees, as many plants as possible and let us know um, how many visits they're getting. And then we aggregate that data to identify which plants do best in, in different parts of the United States. So it may be that the East Bay, to, uh, East Bay, there are different plants that support pollinators than in San Francisco. I would expect that that close a distance, that's not true, but we may see differences between Sacramento and San Francisco. We have pretty different climates different bees, there are lots of reasons. 
And then our last program is the Great Habitat Challenge. And this is a program where we evaluate and improve habitat for pollinators. So let me show you how these are put together and I'll give you a little history of the project. The first thing we had to do when we came up the, uh, with the idea to start the Great Sunflower Project was come up with a simple protocol that the general public could do where we thought that the data would be easy to collect and accurate, because we really wanted to make sure that we could use these data for analysis. So what we came up with is this. People who participate go out, they watch a single flower. Um, we originally started with sunflowers. Um, we have people all use the same variety, the lemon queen sunflower. You can get it at, at almost any garden store in the Bay Area now. So please go out and buy one. And um, you go out and once the, the flower is blooming, you watch how many pollinators visit that flower. So you can see on this lovely lemon queen sunflower, there is a single bee visiting. You might watch for five minutes. Um, this particular sample happened for 15 minutes and you just count how many bees visit. If you know the kind of bee it is, you can report that. So for example, this um, person, Dolores, reported um, that four bees visited her sunflower, three bumblebees, and then a bee that she didn't know what it was. The other data that she uh, records is the date in which she did this. This is over, uh, she did this over 10 years ago. Um, the number of flowers that she watched, she watched one. If you're a botanist, you might point out to me that each of these ones in here is a little flower, but we go with the whole inflorescence. And then um, we have you uh, report where you are, give us an address that we convert into a latitude and longitude. And then we need to know how long you, you um, you followed the, sorry, how long you recorded for. So this was a 15 minute sample. So she saw four bees in 15 minutes and we convert that to our key metric, which is bees per hour per flower, 16 bees per hour per flower. This is typical data. You can participate, you can participate um, in the uh, sunflower project by doing um, this type of count on a lemon queen sunflower, or if you just have other plants in your gardens, um, we'd love to have that data. And those data allow us um, uh, go into the pollinator friendly plant program. Um, and the perfect thing to do for that is to, to collect data from each of the plants in your yard. And then you will know, like you'll know which of those plants are attracting the most bees. It's fun. All right, so what do we do with that data? Well, um, I'm an ecologist, I study um, how landscape change influences um, pollinators. And um, what I do with a typical, uh, uh, what I do with these data is aggregate them. So here's the, actually the site where, where um, Dolores from the previous slide is. She's in Lovettsville, Virginia. And you can see here that she's in a relatively agricultural area. We take these data and we um, basically uh, put a circle down over this site and we calculate things like the percent of land that is in agriculture, how much of the land is cement, what's the density of housing, what's the weather like there, um, how much pesticide is used in the crops in, in this area. And we can use those things to evaluate what are the drivers of pollination services. Now we decided to, we talk about this as pollination services because our metric is the number of visits that a plant gets. So one of the questions I always get is, does it matter if a bee visits twice? And it doesn't matter at all because what we're paying attention to is how many visits plants are getting. We're, we're looking at that service that bees are providing. Now, if you remember back to when I first started talking, um, one of our goals or our main goal was to identify where bees were doing well and doing poorly, where are the pollination deserts? And um, here's what it looks like. So here we've done an analysis um, where we have um, grouped the data from all of the sites. Um, and for this particular analysis, 
we focused on the Eastern United States and the Western United States because we had the most data. Now, areas that um, I have the dot color um, range from red, meaning that there are high pollination services there to blue where there are low pollination services. And then um, what I wanna draw your attention to are these maroon circles. So our analysis has identified two areas of the country that are, 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 have significantly lower pollination service than the rest of the country. Um, the first one is here from Southern California going up through the Central Valley. We see lower than expected pollination services there. And then in this region of the, what do I wanna call it? Central Midwest. Um, that's another area where we see lower than expected pollination services. Interestingly, um, up here in the Pacific Northwest and um, here in the Northeast, we actually see higher than expected pollination services and we're not completely sure why. There are a couple hypotheses we've been looking at for why these areas are more impacted. Of course, through the Central Valley, um, we think it's a combination of um, uh, chemicals used in agriculture, uh, disturbance of the land, but also that um, this region of California has experienced drought over the, the 12 years that we've been doing this project. And so we think that there's an impact of, of all of those things that's driving the, um, the effects here. Um, in the central Midwest, this is also an area that has higher than expected levels of pollution, but we're still um, working to understand sort of what might be the drivers of this decline. So um, you see that we see declines. Well, um, one of the other things that's interesting about working on a citizen science project is that you interact with the public. And almost immediately when people started participating, we started getting this. Oh my gosh, I have no bees, what do I do? So here's a map of the Bay Area. Here I've zoomed in on, on San Francisco proper. Oh, I need to move my, sorry, my circles moved down. Oh, let me go back, sorry. Um, we had a lot of people say, oh my gosh, I see no bees. So what do I do? You know, how can I change my, my garden? And so what we've done is we've developed what we call the Great Habitat Challenge. And we've put together a checklist of questions that you can ask about your garden. Um, you, do a, you can do a habitat assessment and ask things like, are there areas with sandy loamy soil? And we teach you how to actually tell if it's sandy loamy soil. Um, and you can run through that. And then we suggest some things that you can do for your garden. Now, for those of you um, who are interested in sort of how effective this type of program is, um, we were surprised and delighted to discover that when we looked at how many people took action after participating in the Great Habitat Challenge, we found that over 75% of the people who participated, who ran through that checklist, actually took one of the actions that we suggested um, act, suggest that that we suggest after they they do that thing. So, I am a huge supporter of citizen science. I think it gives people agency. Like you can find out how your yard is doing, and you can compare that to what else is happening in the Bay Area. You also can have find some tools to actually think about making some changes. And um, we think that by getting large number, numbers of people to be aware, to have agency, to have some tools for doing conservation, this is actually how we're going to do conservation in the future. And in particular, how we're going to affect bees or improve habitat for bees and improve habitat for all of us and make sure that breakfast is conserved. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Laboon. And if you wanna learn more about the Great Sunflower Project and how you might participate, you can visit www.greatsunflower.org. Up next, we'll watch the short film, Detroit Hives, and then hear from the subjects of the film, the founders of Detroit Hives, Tim Paul and Nicole Lindsay. Detroit Hives is a nonprofit organization working to create sustainable communities and bee populations by transforming vacant locks, lots into pollinator friendly spaces. This short film was co-directed by Palmer Morse and Rachel Weinberg. 
You can find out more about their work at sprucetonefilms.com. And after the film, Tim and Nicole will join us to share a little bit more about what's been going on at Detroit Hives since the short was made. First up though, we'll take a quick pause for another photo show. Detroit is a place of like innovators, creatives. It's a great place to come and start over again. I think it's definitely important for people who belong to that community to kind of help rebuild it. During the crisis and during the foreclosure and the bankruptcy of Detroit, a lot of people lost their homes and moved out. Unfortunately, within that area, the city is not building any new homes. By activating these vacant spaces and transforming them into urban farms or bee farms, we're able to have vast amounts of fresh vegetables that our bees and our pollinators can cross pollinate to provide for the community. What we do is transform Detroit vacant lots into urban bee farms. All my life I've been born and raised here in the Motor City. My grandmother would always create home remedies whenever me and my brother would get sick. So when I got sick in December, I went back to those methods. I came across the power of local raw honey from a local store in Ferndale, Michigan. When that worked, it like, we, it clicked. Like, okay, let's study more about this honey and its medicinal properties. Since we started, it has been the year of the yes. When opportunities come, we say yes. And it has helped us get to this. <laughs> number We're definitely changing the typical stereotypes of beekeeping, particularly here in America. Um, you typically don't see too many beekeepers of color. By my interest, I want to help inspire others that they can do the same thing. It's important to um, expose our children to something that I know they're not familiar with. For one, we never know where it might take them. A lot of these children never even seen the honeycomb before, and they have very little knowledge of bees, so it feels great to educate them on the importance of honeybee conservation. Uh, 
Growing up as a kid, uh, it wasn't cool to be into science or to keep bees or to be outside in nature. So we really didn't see a lot of those positive figures or people out there. So I think it's important for someone like me to be in a position of leadership to inspire other people that it's cool to learn about science. It's cool to give back to your environment and your community. When people find out about our organization, they're like, wait, you're in Detroit? The shock value when we get people and we tell them that we're beekeepers, they look at us twice. You don't have to have a million dollars in your bank account to start an idea. Go for it. Starting a nonprofit organization within the community, it helps inspire others to feel that they can do the same thing. It's important to pass on this education to our generation so they can create a better future for themselves. There was a problem that we seen in our city. There was a problem that we seen with our honeybees. What we're doing here is solving both of those problems. So thank you so much, Nicole and Tim, for joining me. And we just got to watch the short film, Detroit Hives, that sort of documents your journey getting started. Uh, that was made in 2019. And I think you've grown quite a bit and changed a little bit. So could you tell us a little bit about that growth and where you're heading? Absolutely, absolutely. Detroit is the place to be. Since the last time um, that video was made in 2019, we've been buzzing. We've been buzzing and been able to fulfill our mission. So just starting with, we've been able to educate over 2,000 students on the importance of bee conservation through our Bee to Change program. We've also expanded in over 13 locations, managing over 45 beehives right here in the city of Detroit. According to our goal, our original goal was to manage over 200 hives. But as we took a step back, we wanted to find ways to support biodiversity and inclusion meaning that we now support our native bees and honeybees. And Michigan is home to over 450 native bees. We also partner with the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy to recognize Detroit as an official bee city. Nicole and I co-founded National Urban Beekeeping Day, which is celebrated annually on July 19th. We also expanded nationally with Mohais KC in Kansas City, Missouri, and we've been able to just keep things buzzing. We got a lot of great things in store for this year. We can't wait to share. Yeah. So I'm also curious, could you share a little bit about how COVID has affected your work and how you had to change during this um, time of shelter in place and social distancing? So 2020 was a, was a very interesting year, very challenged for most. Of course, uh, with COVID-19 in place, we had to close our doors uh, to all of our in-person tours and education opportunities, um, close our doors to fundraising events, speaking um, engagements, and that pretty much set us back. However, Nicole and I had to find ways to be creative and pivot around our challenges. So in response to COVID, we delivered over 300 Be Well care packages that consist of basic relief of honey, uh, beeswax candles, protective face gear. We deliver this to our local heroes, our frontline responders, and our healthcare workers. We also made a switch to pivoting to a virtual educational platform, providing virtual tours and educational workshops. And lastly, we launched our first ever 
Virtual Forger 5K, which is a 5K walk to educate the general public on how to spot pollinators on and native plants while walking and running. And the courage to get outside. Everyone was doing it. Everyone was doing uh, stuck inside during the stay home shelter. We want to find ways for people to go out, um, exercise, but also find ways to incorporate nature on their path. Uh, that's amazing that you did so much during such a challenging time and sort of moved so quickly to think about what you could do to bring more attention to bees and your work. Absolutely. Um, but also trying to find yeah. ways to incorporate people and pollinators as we work to right. uh, create communities for pollinators, but we also want to uh, affect and improve the lives upon the neighbors and residents that live with them as well. And um, related to that, uh, could you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing around food insecurity and how your bees are doing a lot of pollination for fresh food for Detroit? Right. So the city of Detroit currently has well over 75,000 vacant lots. Um, and most of these areas that are underserved, that are within underserved communities, are people of color that don't have access to fresh organic food. We have access to liquor stores or gas stations or fast food restaurants. So through our bees, we partner with community gardens to provide food security. Our bees have food security through nectar and pollen. And in return, bees pollen those flowers to provide fresh vegetables for our tables. So I'm curious too, you two came to beekeeping somewhat recently as we learned in the short film. And I read, Nicole, you actually had a little bit of fear of bees. So I'm curious if you could talk about how you got over that and um, your advice to people to sort of be open to new experiences and learning about bees or other things they might be scared of. Absolutely. So um, we were actually both had a fear of bees, um, but it's through education that through this education about learning about bees that that fear transformed into love. Um, and so learning about how great these little creatures are and how they're important to our environment, um, that fear just kind of, it went away. And then having hands-on experience and working with them and just learning that difference between wasps or yellow jackets and honeybees, which a lot of people have fear of or they think are bees. Um, I, you know, I educate people on that and that kind of eases their fears. And especially when they come and do tours at our bee farm, uh, they can get a hands-on experience. Then I can tell the difference between the two because there are two different personalities when you're working with yellow jackets and honeybees. So my main key advice is education, which is actually one of our components uh, with our mission with Detroit Hives. We focus on education and conservation. Um, and so that's how I help you know people get over their fears. What about girls and the organizer? Yeah. yeah, and so also we're working with young girls because we get a lot of Girl Scouts come by and through schools. And a lot of them have fears just like I did. Mm -hmm. And um, so I help them ease their fears and kind of introduce them to the world of insects. And, um, and so I'm making sure that they're getting over their fear. But I also tell them that a honeybee hive is actually a female ran super organism. And so it kind of gives them that, that girl empowerment mm -hmm. or women's empowerment. And then, you know, it kind of gets them at ease too. So they're kind of excited, like, wait, it's, it's females that's running this, this honey beehive? And I was like, yes. You know, the bees that you see out working hard and collecting the nectar and the pollen, those are females. And it's ran by, and they have a queen inside of the hive. There's no king. Um, it's all females working inside of the hive. Well, thank you both so much. And I'm wondering, we can almost see what your sweatshirt says, but before we go, oh. can we get a full view of your fantastic? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Detroit is the place to be. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, thank you both so much, yeah. um, both for talking with us and for all of the amazing work that you're doing with Detroit Hive. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Next up, we'll hear from Cameron Redford. Based in Nevada City, California, Cam recently became the owner of Black Sierra Honey Company and initiated the Black Hives Matter project. In his work, he aims to bring equity and inclusivity to beekeeping, as well as provide food and educational opportunities to his communities. 
He also seeks to uncover and connect to the history of African beekeeping, which he has found to be underdocumented and underrepresented. In this conversation with my Exploratorium colleague, Estelle Davis, Cameron will share more about the Black Lives Matter project and discuss his perspective on the history of beekeeping. But before we get to Cameron and Estelle, we have one more bee slideshow to share with you. All right, Kim, welcome to After Dark Online. Uh, I am Estelle, I work at the Exploratorium, but Cam, it's good to have you here because I've known you for several years from uh, Oakland, Bay Area, from before Black Hives Matter. So it's good to see you uh, in this, this new project you're in and um, share your work with the Exploratorium, our Exploratorium community. So um, could you start us off just telling us a little bit more about you, where you and your bees are located and tell us about the Black Hives Matter project. Thanks, Estelle. Um, yeah, so as Estelle introduced me, I'm Cameron Redford, also known as Cam. Um, I've been uh, working with the project, the Black Hives Matter project since uh, June 29th. I remember the day I launched it because that was also the day my daughter was born. Um, our project uh, is based- Which is on, incredible, by the way, that yeah. you started a brand new business on the day also of a birth, a, a, a twins. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about it like that. Um, yeah, I guess they are twins in that way. Um, yeah, something else I'll share is my, my daughter's uh, name uh, is Oyin, which is the Yoruba word for honey. Um, yeah. And so uh, our project is launched here in Nevada County, um, California. Um, and we keep our bees here, mostly in Nevada County. Um, we have them all the way from down at an elevation of about 900, 1,000 feet, um, close to the, the uh, San Joaquin Valley. And then going all the way up to the crest of Donner Pass, um, up in the Sierra Nevada, and then even to the other side of the Sierra, um, into the Sierra Valley. So it's a big, big range of about almost 200 miles. Thanks, Cam. Um, so I will ask you a little bit more about beekeeping later because it, I don't even understand how you get to cover 200 miles. But uh, before we talk about your trade, I, I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about you and um, what brought you to Nevada City and how you were introduced to farming and beekeeping? So I um, originally am from Florida. I was born and raised uh, down in South Florida and uh, really enjoyed like being in the wilderness and outdoors there, which was uh, kind of formative for me um, in uh, yeah, my journey to this. Um, and so moving out of like the Everglades region, I, I came to California. Um, really not knowing what I was doing and uh, lived in the city for a while. And um, I got involved with the permaculture projects, um, urban permaculture projects. And through that, I was connected to a, a permaculture design course. And through that, 
I met most of the people who uh, are really formative in my life today. Um, yeah, and that was a, by a woman named Starhawk uh, who put that on. And through that, I've, uh, yeah, things have just really expanded for me in, in this agricultural realm and the realm of urban ag, but now I live in a rural area. So uh, yeah, shifting then into that too, as well. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned um, when you launched your project that um, Nevada City is one of the least diverse, uh, or the county is one of the least diverse counties in the state. So yes. uh, what's it like out there as a farmer? It's, uh, it can be interesting. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's the way in which like farming is, it's, uh, it's kind of isolated, you know, like uh, isolating. Uh, as I came into this area and started doing this work, like as uh, COVID started, um, you know, as we're here at the one year mark for COVID, like I, I noticed, I was like, I don't know if anything about my life has really changed um, because I spent most of my time just me and uh, the one other person who I work the hives with, um, who is also my sister-in-law. So um, yeah, it it's, uh, can be isolating in that way. Um, but we have experienced discrimination. Um, there were some things that were said and done um, towards me when I set out to do this mission that, um, yeah, there was definitely like prejudice, racism involved. And, uh, you know, we work, we work with that and that's just something that's, that's part of it here. Um, and we've had some, some greater issues in the community uh, around some of that stuff and uh, just the um, disconnect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so the Black Hives Matter project, uh, can you tell us more about how you came to that, that name for your, for your beekeeping company? Um, so that's a fun story. Uh, as I uh, set out to do this and um, work in telling the story of uh, Black agriculture in America, Black beekeeping in America, the journey of uh, what I like to call like the diaspora of bees and the African peoples in America. Um, and I was, I was trying to come up with names and I was uh, brainstorming with some people and someone, you know, like almost jokingly was like, Black Hives Matter. And I was like, nah, not that, man. I'm not going to use that. And I, it's kind of stuck with me because it was catchy. And I was like, you know, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to upset so many people. Like, you know, I, as I said, like I live in this very non-diverse county um, with a lot of conservative views. And I was like, some people see the, the words Black Lives Matter and their, their heads almost explode. Um, and I was like, how, how am I going to get, you know, um, the help I need with that? But as I, as I thought about it more, I was like, you know, I'm really seeking support from people who are seeking to be allies. And, um, and then I finally looked it up. And as I looked it up, uh, you know, like Google the name Black Lives Matter to see if anyone had already said it, because I was like, surely someone has thought of the connection between the two. And uh, what I found was uh, someone was selling a bunch of T-shirts that said all hives matter. And I was like, that seals it. Like, we're doing it. <laughs> um, Black Lives Matter. We're going all the way. So that's that story. Mm -hmm. And so and so that that fundraiser that you launched to to launch your business I just looked at recently and it has over 675 supporters already, which is incredible. Um, do you find that uh, like the, the way that you're now known, is that uh, seem to be a very, very regional support or are your, are your supporters and the people who are aware of the project um, statewide or national? Where, where do you no notice that those supporters are coming from? Um, we have seen the most epic outpouring of support, literally like it's, it's come, it's meta. It's, it's from coming from everywhere. It's, uh, we've seen support coming from this community in a, in a big way. A lot of, a lot of people stood up and, and supported us in this community. A lot of, uh, organizations and, and businesses and co-ops in this area came and supported us here in Nevada City, Nevada County area. And, uh, on the wider scale, I, receive support from folks in uh in london um so it's it's also like international we, we've actually received like international support support from all over california um different states connected to other other black beekeepers who are doing similar work that's been just amazing to to make those connections and find other people uh out here doing the same work in the world um through the power of the internet thank you <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's fun for it was fun for us at the Exploratorium to be able to connect some of those projects from across the country together here mm -hmm. today too.
Um, well, so shifting over um, to beekeeping, you mentioned that your hives span over 200 miles. And uh, I know a little bit about bees, but not a lot about beekeeping as a business or you know how it actually looks day to day how do you manage to get across 200 miles what does that what does that mean how many hives are you maintaining and how often do you visit them um so it's 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 stretched and it's gone different places uh something i didn't mention when you asked about like how i started in this business specifically beekeeping was um i uh i, I began working for another company which is uh what Black Hives Matter uh, and our, our, under our, uh, our business name, Black Hives Matter is the name of our project. Our business name is the Black Sierra Honey Company. Um, and so as I went to work for someone who, who hired me and, and taught me um, much of what I know today about beekeeping, um, I started working and we had about 230 hives back then. Um, we've had some hard years here. So the, the number fluctuates. Um, I think we've gone from as many as uh, 300 hives to 100, and we've been fluctuating in between those numbers. Um, it's hard years for bees, uh, especially with the California droughts and smoke and fires. Um, so those are things that are all affecting them, along with the greater, greater issues that bees are facing today, such as mites and pesticides and all of those things. Um, but so, yeah, in right now, we're about at 100. Um, and yeah, like, what it means to have hives spanning across such a large distance means I drive a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, visit the apiaries. And uh, we have like a migratory pattern that we do basically with the bees, which is that they can go up into the, into the high mountains up to elevation. Um, we keep them up at 6,000 feet around is our highest elevation. And from that elevation, we then like migrate them down the hill when the snow is calm and it gets really, uh, blustery up there in Donner Pass, um, you know, with 12 feet of snow and all that, we take them out of there for that, for that time period and bring them down into the lower elevations, like 1,500 feet. Mm -hmm. So then how does honey fit into this entire business model? Um, so honey is, um, we sell our local honey. Um, yeah, and as, like I said, as of this year, it's been a rough year. Um, Basically with bees and, and, um, and honey production, it's like they, the flowers uh, kind of operate on, on their own cycle at, for the, the period of time that they're bloomed for. And so when there's a lot of water in the ground, those flowers will stay out longer and they will continue to pump out nectar. When there's not a lot of water in the ground and there's not a lot of water falling from the sky, basically they come out and they, they have a, a short life. Um, and that life doesn't have much nectar to it. Um, so in these dry drought years here in California, we don't get a lot. So this year it's been pretty small and um, that, that's a challenge that we're up against. And um, yeah, something else I'll share because you asked about like kind of like the business model and how it works. Um, part of what I'm trying to do and our organization Black Lives Matter is trying to do is raise uh, awareness around um, kind of weaning ourselves in, uh, a way and figuring out a way to better interact with the the greater system of uh of big agriculture and some of the some of the ways that are unsustainable within those systems um and working to kind of like bring more harmony to it because we do work in big agriculture as you would call it some folks um disagree with a lot of the ways that, that things are done as do i and what i've inherited here as um is this this model that's a very like uh mass produced model of, of beekeeping. And I'm trying to work it, work it into this way that uh, brings it uh, into a holistic manner as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you're speaking to our audience today around uh, how bees are having a hard year and a, a lot of beekeeping businesses um, have to balance these things, are, is there anything that people can do at home that can support um, a more sustainable life for honeybees? For sure. Um, there's the, the complexities of, of uh, like I was saying, that, that mass model. It's part of that is the complexity around almonds and, and bees. Um, most beekeepers in America um, are dependent on, on pollinating and uh, in a big way, California almond season is where, where they all come. 
and we're, we're we bring these bees and so we have this like big uh almost like party or festival here in california where all the bees come in february and then from all over the country literally from florida from washington state from the far away as maine they all come here and then they they rub elbows and then they go home and so any diseases and pests and things like that that the bees are picking up are pesticides um go home with the bees um and so uh, one way to help with that system is is that like part of it is that beekeepers are no longer really able to sustain themselves off of just selling honey. Um, and part of that is uh, the influx of honeys that are coming in from around the world, um, such as like um, people, you know, a lot of, lot of honeys coming from out of uh, Patagonia, um, area, uh, regions in China and things like that. Buying local honey is the best way to help uh, beekeepers. Um, best way I know how um, buying local honey. And secondary to that would be um, planting and keeping in crops uh, or uh, not weed whacking crops um, that will bloom late in the season, um, which here in California is like uh, September uh, to November. Anything that could bloom in that time period is really helpful for the bees because that's when they don't have much food to eat at all. All right, I, I do have, I have some flowers in my yard that I, I'm excited about for, for these specifically. I have an echium front yard, so they're all coming into bloom now, these amazing purple uh, sort of peaked flowers, and the entire front yard is buzzing at another level. But I don't know if I have late season flowers, so I'm gonna yeah, do some a, research on that. Yeah, it's a department to, to cover because that's that's when the, the, they call it the dearth. Um, and that's uh, it's a very long dearth here on the west coast and in the desert regions where it's just yep. like there's nothing nothing to eat when there's no no water falling. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I wanted to shift gears a little bit uh, away from the day to day about beekeeping and then a little bit more into uh, some of your research that you've done and your own uh, sort of views around a history of beekeeping and. Um, Black Hives Matter and sort of the, the rich cultural history that you've identified around beekeeping and its roots to Africa. Um, could you just share some of that history with us now? Yeah. Um, so as I delved into what I really wanted um, this project to represent as I like, this is my personal journey that that grew outwards for me. Um, and, you know, also like was inspired by the work of other people. And so as I um, was like, okay, I am a black man in a very um, non-diverse space, um, trying to do this work um, in agriculture and thinking of the history of agriculture and black Americans. And, you know, of course, if you look back far enough in the history of agriculture and black Americans, you will come up to the, the issue of slavery. And, uh, and it, track it all the way back through the diaspora and when to, to when um, the first African peoples arrived on this continent um, and when, uh, when bees arrived. And so that, that was like the, the beginning of the, of the really interesting part of it for me was as I started looking back and, and trying to like, like understand the history before I, I went forward, I, um, something that I, I found really, really fascinating was uh, I looked back and so, the beginning of the Atlantic slave trade into the colonies of, the, of um, what would become America, um, the British colonies, um, it started in 1619 in Jamestown, Virginia, um, to the Jamestown colony. They brought the first African folks from Angola, I believe it was. And that was three years before the arrival in 1622 of the first beehives from that they had brought over from Europe. And so knowing those two things that like almost the same same time frame in the same exact place also the bees came to the Jamestown colony um to the same port of call there all this had, all this coalesced and yet I looked up the history of black beekeepers and could find nothing um shockingly nothing um it seemed as if it was like a vacuum and and that just didn't sit right with me. There was something to me that seemed off about it. And uh, through some other reading I did and, and research, I was like, you know, we're looking at um, chattel slavery in America. And what, 
the, the, the roles that, that the Africans that were enslaved, they were bringing over for, mostly were the ones that people didn't want to do themselves, the hard, laborious, um, challenging jobs, dangerous jobs. And um, for me, thinking that like uh, a plantation owner who has hundreds of enslaved people is like, I'm going to go out and work the bees. Um, it didn't seem like that was likely to me. And yet I could find n virtually nothing. And so as I continue to just do this research, um, it, um, yeah, I, I delve deeper into um, the erasure of black farming in history. Yeah, I continue delving around into it and I, I discovered that actually um, a really interesting note I found in something that was unrelated but also related in the agricultural sense was um, uh, in the Carolinas, while they were still colonies as well, um, they began to grow um, rice. Um, and rice had been growing, uh, you know, all over the world, it had already been dispersed pretty well. Um, but they began to try to grow it as an as a, um, agricultural crop, cultivate it, and they were really failing at it. They were doing a pretty bad job down there in the Carolinas under the, the leadership of these um, European folks who had come over um, to the colonies. And what they realized were they didn't know enough about growing rice, but they figured out who did. And they went to Africa and specifically took peoples from tribes in Africa who knew how to grow, grow rice and brought them over to the colonies to, to head up those, those divisions and show them how to grow rice. Um, wow. Even though they were entirely actually dependent on them, they're, they're, most likely their ventures would have failed. And so that stu stood out to me because of the way that um, there were many African peoples um, who have a historical and uh, oral traditions of working with bees uh, that have no influence still to this day uh, from the Western um, school of thought, uh, European schools um, through the, like the Langstroth and all that, which is uh, what, what most beekeeping today in the Americas and in Europe and all over the world comes from, there were these peoples who had been working with bees um, since before anybody really knows. Um, our, our earliest uh, depictions of, of beekeeping um, come from Egypt uh, and they're in literal hieroglyphs and there's, there's honey found in, in tombs in Egypt that's still edible. And so this history goes very, very, very far back and those peoples would have come to the Americas and seen bees and in their hives and recognize them. It would have, I, I can only imagine the, the way that they must have felt uh, some, maybe some relief seeing something that they recognized um, on this completely different continent um, so far away from their home in this way. Wow, that's awesome. So it sounds like in addition to beekeeping, you're also going to have a future career as a historian <laughs> uncovering some lost histories. It's incredible, thank you. Um, wondering, given some of that history and that you described that there are maybe around 50,000 black farmers in the US now, why do you think it's important to have black representation in agriculture? As I was saying earlier, uh, the way that black people created the wealth of this nation through that agriculture, um, growing indigo, rice, um, all these crops that, that without it, this, this country would not have been able to grow to what it is. Those colonies would not have grown into what they were strong enough to, to become a country and, and so forth and so on. And, uh, you know, slavery went on for another 200 years from the, the, the time of arrival. And just thinking of, of um, you know, and beyond that, going into the, the, the history of sharecroppers in the South and the Great Migration and all these things, um, and the way that uh, that level of uh, oppression that people experience, um, there, there are ways in which I feel like uh, people in the Black community were, were driven away from it um, by um, wanting to leave behind that trauma of, 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 of uh, ensla enslavement you know, wanting to leave that behind. And, um, and then I think that there's also the, the, uh, the way that uh, systemic oppression um, came in and took lands away from people's um, predatory loans, bank lending, all kinds of different things. Um, the history of, uh, of the, the federal government not giving subsidies 
to um, Black Americans and, and all these all these different ways in which that there's there's almost like a, a, a I mean there is a systemic way in which lands were stripped away and people were pushed pushed off of them, and that connection to the land to me is so important. Um, really has healed me and saved my life personally, and uh, I want that same feeling for for people who who want to reconnect in a way. Um, I believe that like as a greater as a whole, like the the, the whole world needs that that healing with learning how to be with nature and in animal husbandry and in connection to, to the crops and land and soil in those ways. Um, and specifically uh, in the black community, um, I just find that, um, yeah, it's, it's really powerful to connect to that history and to connect to, to the way that, um, yeah, we really did a lot of work to build what you see today as the agricultural system. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love the way that you're uh, thinking about reclamation and healing. And it seems like the Black Lives Matter project is sort of part of a much greater um, network of folks who are doing reclaiming and empowering themselves back to the earth in that way. So thank you for sharing that as well. Um, we're going to wrap in just a few minutes, but I, I wanted to bring uh, the, the conversation back one more time to Black Lives Matter project and ask you what's going on uh, with next steps in that pro project and if anyone who's watching today wants to learn more or get involved what 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 should they do? Yeah so the Black Lives Matter project as we uh, as we launched it um, we set our goal um, it's very small because we were like no way you know maybe we'll we'll get to the numbers we want to get to and uh, in two days we had raised our, our first goal, which was $20,000. And then we raised the goal to 40,000 because we were like, actually 20,000 wasn't gonna do much for us um, in the end, but you know, it was, it, it was, it was a great start. And so now we're to 40,000 and, um, and we passed that. And um, that was the money that we were looking for to be able to, to purchase the apiary, um, our um, beekeeping business that we, uh, we are now uh, the Black Sierra Honey Company. And so where we're moving from here is into more work that is a uh, work in education, um, bringing this, this learning and the teaching of bees. I love teaching about beekeeping. It's a passion of mine, um, a life uh, goal and mission that's been for me is, uh, is teaching and agriculture. And so filling out that, uh, that teaching piece is something that we're moving into. And so we're still seeking funds to, uh, to get us to that level that we want to get to, to be bringing this to young indigenous, black um, and uh, Latino, um, POC youth um, in the cities and also out here rurally, um, bringing it into just like the, into equity and into representation for, for many peoples um, who are underrepresented in agriculture. Awesome, that sounds like a beautiful vision. Well, and, well one thing is just so if, if folks want to check out the project, we are still up and live on um, GoFundMe, uh, which is uh, GoFundMe and slash Black Lives Matter Project .com and uh, come check it out. You can just Google Black Lives Matter Project. We're also on Instagram as Black Lives Matter Project. And uh, yeah, we release lots of updates and uh, are still looking for help. All right, great. Well, thank you again so much, Cam, for joining us tonight for After Dark Online. And I can't wait to see uh, what is going to be coming from Black Lives Matter Project in the next few years and to go out and visit you when COVID uh, calms down and see the beast for myself. Please do. Love to have you over. All right. Thanks, Cam. Bye. To close out tonight's program, we'll check out a four minute video from Deep Look, a short video series that explores big scientific mysteries by going incredibly small. Deep Look is produced by KQED, the public media station in San Francisco, and presented by PBS Digital Studios. Introducing the short is Deep Look coordinating producer Gabriela Quiros. Gabriela started her journalism career 27 years ago as a newspaper reporter in Costa Rica, where she grew up. She won the National Science Journalism Award there for a series of articles about organic agriculture and developed a lifelong interest in health reporting. She joined KQED in 2006 to produce science videos. 
She has won three regional Emmys as a TV producer and has shared three more as the coordinating producer of Deep Look. Here's Gabriela. Hi everyone, my name is Gabriela Quiroz and I am the coordinating producer and also one of the episode producers for Deep Look. Deep Look is a science video series produced by KQED, the public broadcasting station in San Francisco, California. And we create short videos, they're about four or five minutes long, about small animals and plants. And our goal is to give people a view of the natural world that is very, very close up, a view that they rarely uh, would get to see otherwise. And we use macro lenses to get really close up. And sometimes we also put the animals and plants under the microscope to give an even closer up view. We have released 130 videos. We started releasing videos uh, back in 2014. And we are now in our eighth season. And because we focus on small animals, we have covered a lot of different insects and also arachnids, spiders, crickets, mosquitoes, ticks. And we try to answer interesting questions in each of our videos, questions that people might have asked themselves or maybe they haven't. Um, sometimes we're covering insects that are very familiar to people and they might not know everything about them and might be surprised to find out, for example, that mosquitoes actually use six different needles to suck our blood, or that ticks use a mouthful of hooks to dig into us. Uh, so I have um, focused on covering a lot of different insects that like to suck our blood, for example, mosquitoes and ticks. And, but I also love covering bees. And I produced a video about honeybees and what it is that they do with the pollen that they're collecting uh, when they're going from flower to flower. I also produced an episode about uh, orchard bees. And the episode that you will be seeing is about some bees that probably you're not familiar with. They're used in agriculture. They're the second most important bees used in agriculture after honeybees. And they're called alfalfa leaf cutting bees. And we went out and filmed them in the, in the Central Valley of California in Fresno. And they were being used by farmers there to pollinate alfalfa plants that were actually going to be harvested for their seeds. So other growers could plant those alfalfa seeds to produce alfalfa hay and alfalfa hay is fed to dairy cows. California is the most important dairy producing state in the country. And of course, with milk, you can make all sorts of delicious things. So we had a great fun finding a title for the video and ended up calling it, this bee gets punched by flowers for your ice cream. And if you, um, when you see the video, you'll see that these bees go through a lot to, uh, to help us pollinate those flowers. And I'm not gonna say anything more, but um, the flowers have a trip mechanism um, that is very unique. And these, uh, these bees are game. <laughs> they, um, they don't mind getting punched in the face, literally. Um, as a producer for Deep Look, um, I have a great job. I get to interview lots of scientists and um, come up with story ideas. I then go out in the field with our cinematographer, Josh Cassidy, and uh, help produce those um, filming days. And I come home with the material, I edit it, um, I look through it, help write the script, and then work on, on the script with our writer and narrator, Laura Clivens. I, as I said, I do the editing, the first edit of the video, and then I work with our After Effects artist, Kia Simon, who creates all the beautiful After Effects um, compositions that you've seen in our videos that are one of our signatures. Uh, another one of our signatures are the unique 
um, original scores that Seth Samuel creates for each one of our videos. And uh, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to leave you with this bee gets punched by flowers for your ice cream. Okay, this bee seems confused. That leaf she's gnawing on is no flower. But this is an alfalfa leaf cutting bee. She needs hunks of leaves to build her nest. A lot of them. All this is her lacy handiwork. She hauls the pieces back home. Leaf cutters use them to line the inside of their nest. In nature, she might use a nook and cranny in a log. But here, her nest is in what's basically a bee apartment building, a high rise made of styrofoam. These markings help the bee find her way back to her personal condo. You know, like 7B. And furnishing it takes a while, because see that pile? These are the pieces they dropped. The bees are here to work in this alfalfa field in California. They're from Europe originally, but farmers here use them because they have a real knack for pollinating alfalfa flowers, which grow tiny seeds inside these curly pods. Farmers use the seeds to plant new fields of alfalfa, which is grown to make hay, to feed these gals. So really, your glass of milk comes courtesy of these bees. But pollinating alfalfa flowers is a lot trickier than it looks. Even honeybees can't really hack it. Here's why. Alfalfa keeps its pollen locked away inside its flowers. To get it, the bees have to step on a spring-loaded petal called a keel petal. Here's how it works. Pop! It releases this column that has the pollen at the end. It's called tripping the flower. Here it is again. The column has some force. The bee might get a good thwack in the face. Leaf cutting bees just don't care. They can take a punch. Pop. Pop. Honeybees don't really like to tangle with that. They'll usually step around gingerly, trying to sip nectar from the side without setting it off. Leaf cutting bees get coated in pollen and bring it back home to their nest so they can pack it in there to feed their growing babies. Each one is bundled in a little leaf-wrapped bassinet. Ah, there they are. The siblings all lined up together. A new generation of the toughest little bees around. <laughs>